how could a young Chinese immigrant with only $50 in his pocket, hardly able to speak English, become a world-renowned laser eye surgeon? And what led this scientific-minded atheist to believe in a creator? Our guest today, Dr. Ming Wang, earned his MD at Harvard and his PhD in laser physics from MIT. He's written 100 scientific papers, 10 textbooks, and played the Chinese violin Erhu alongside Dolly Parton. Quite obviously, he has a story that needs to be heard. Dr. Wang, thanks so much for joining me. This is really a treat. Thank you, Sean, uh, for uh, ha having me on your show. Well, let's jump right into your story, which is absolutely captivating. You were born in China in 1960, and the Cultural Revolution began in 1966 when you're only six years old. Explain to our audience what happened and how that affected you and your family. Yes, thank you. Um, in 1966, the government in China decided the best way to basically keep people ignorant is to basically affect the next generation's educational process because people with knowledge and education is a threat to you know dictatorship. So uh, they started the Cultural Revolution which lasted for 10 years from 1966 to 1976, during which time they shut down all universities and colleges of entire China. And they sent away to some of the poorest part of the country, um, every single high school graduate. Um, and uh, for, for lifetime of, uh, send them for lifetime of poverty and hard labor. Wow. They will never be able to come back. So over 10 years of Cultural Revolution, by shutting down all universities and colleges of entire China, they sent away to basically labor camp 20 million young people. Oh. Okay, 20 million young people. Now maybe tell us a little about where you lived and your family. You have did you have brothers and sisters at the time? Did you have, what, what did your dad do and mom for a profession? Mm -hmm. Tell us about that if you will. I was born in a city south of Shanghai called Hangzhou and um, into a family of um, medical professionals. My father is an internist, a uh, medical doctor, and my mother is a teacher in a medical school. Mm -hmm. And I have a younger brother. Um, actually, all of them were depicted in this film upcoming site. And um, my um, father uh, uh, and mom, and they worked very, very hard because it was, we didn't have very much, actually it was very poor. The combined salaries of my parents every month were only $30. Wow. So we have to live on that every, um, I remember, you know, people ask me sometimes, I mean, why you work so hard? What drives you? Uh, my best answer is that I was brought up that way. I was mm -hmm. imprinted the mm -hmm. will to work hard um, because as a, three-year-old kid, I remember, we could only afford eight watt electricity every month. Eight watt is a quarter of a light bulb. That's all the electricity we could afford as a family. We have no, uh, uh, no bathroom, no kitchen, no heater, no air conditioning, no telephone. And so what happened is uh, a dad wants to hang up the eight watt little light uh, bulb very high on the ceiling so the whole room is illuminated a little bit uh, four of us live in one room and uh, but he couldn't study uh, if the light is too high even the room is illuminated but if the light bulbs loaded too low he can read books but the whole room is too dark so he found a solution he hung up the a watt light bulb up in the ceiling so the whole room is, so we all can see each other in the room but then he put two chairs one on, on top of each other. He climbed up there, sit on the top chair. It was summer, very hot. And uh, he was bare chested in his shorts and holding a medical book in his hand and put this uh, light, a watt light right in front of that book so he can both illuminate the room, the light can illuminate the room and also enable him to study. Uh, so close enough to his book. As a three year old, I remember I was playing, uh, looking up saw that and studying with this contraption and for hundreds of little pearls of sweat on his back because it was so hot there was no air conditioning um so that that mental impression that imprinting is what uh, brought me to um 
make me someone who always want to my to do my best whatever i do um in fact i'm very grateful to my parents so i dedicate the film site to them that's amazing now we're going to get to this film i want my viewers to hear all about it and go see it it comes out in may but were you at, at that time it's amazing you had that memory from being three years old were you an outlier among your friends or is this common experience for your peers and most people of that time dealing with that level of really just poverty and working hard and struggling to get by it's very typical mm -hmm. uh, many um uh that you know many uh, people throughout the united states who have seen this film that resonated this part of their lives as well first generation immigrant uh it's very typical and the thing is you know um you know who appreciate sight the most are those who used to be blind mm. uh, appreciate freedom the most are those who used to not have freedom and uh, so appreciate so much what we have in america the freedom the freedom to worship the freedom to seek happiness um that's why this film is remind us how blessed we are to live in this country Talk a little bit about the, your family in terms of religious beliefs. Obviously, in, in China, the state religion is and was atheism. Uh, was that your beliefs? Is there Did there come a point where you're like, I'm an atheist, or was it just what you assumed about the world because your parents and everybody around you believed? Yeah, 95% of people in China were and are still atheists today. Mm. And um, so out of the 5%, and I think probably a few percent, maybe two or three percent uh, uh, Christians and the rest, uh, various different Buddhists is very big. So most of the people are atheists. And so were, um, so was me, uh, my parents, and my brother. So I brought up in the atheist family, even though I was brought up in an atheist family, but it was a family that respecting uh, tradition, re uh, re that respects um, uh, uh, knowledge, uh, uh, scholarship, and so, d despite the fact during the Cultural Revolution we could not were not allowed to read anything other than government assigned books, um, but they always had little books of uh, ancient poets, uh, mm. Chinese poets, and different books are hiding on the shelves behind the official uh, government red book um, that he. Re uh, he read these to me so that very early on he has instilled in me um, a curiosity towards the world beyond China beyond the time we live but also a broader view about the world not just Eastern viewpoints life views but also Western and world views so the Cultural Revolution hit when you were from 6 to 16 years old how did you avoid getting sent to a labor camp and how did you get an education? Uh, that was a good question. Uh, at age 14, 1974, I finished my junior high uh, because my parents always uh, have insisted and encouraged me to study hard. So I studied really hard. So I was a straight A student and looking forward to attending high school. And eventually I wanted to become a doctor. Um, I always wanted to be a doctor as a kid. Daddy and mommy got this little medical, uh, you know, stuff, the instruments, the broken instrument that university, you know, throw away. And I always play a little doctor for my childhood friends and, you know, repair their broken skin or things like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I want to be a doctor. But when I finished my junior high at age 14, 1974, uh, if, uh, the, uh, if, uh, the, Basically, a very uh, difficult situation emerged. If I went on to high school, I would be deported, um, just like 20 million others, for life um, into a, the lifetime poverty and hard labor. And uh, so my parents want to, obvious to, uh, me to avoid that. So with pain, uh, agony, they actually had to stop me from going to further education uh, into high school. Therefore, basically, um, shut down any dream of becoming a doctor and uh, so I stopped uh, my education was abruptly cut after age 14 junior high graduation and then government still want to deport me as uh, unless I could find a way find a job mm -hmm. in cities so that's why I started learning a music instrument 
Chinese violin called Arhu, E-R-H-U, a two-string instrument, and learning dancing. Because if you could play a music instrument and learning dan learn dance, you can get into the government song and dance troupe and therefore being allowed to stay in the cities and uh, exempt, uh, avoid being sent away to labor camp. Very interesting, in China in the m early to mid-1970s, there was this suddenly found interest in music mm. and uh, dancing by tens of thousands of youngsters, teenagers throughout China. And all for the sake, for the reason to survive rather than the love for music and dance. Um, and uh, I was one of them. And uh, then the government discovered we were interested in music and learning dancing with an ulterior motive, really not for music dancing, but to avoid being sent away to labor camp. So they actually stopped uh, everybody's, um, they, they, they wouldn't allow uh, we, and they will not recruit any uh, student um, into the song dance troupe in the cities. So my um, dream of, my goal of avoid being sent away to labor camp got dashed. Uh, so I was going to be sent away to labor camp. And then my parents, uh, my parents smuggled me in into the medical school they were teaching. So I became an illegal medical student with studying medicine illegally without any prospect of becoming a doctor ever. And I asked my father, I said, why should I study? He said, well, knowledge will be good. Knowledge, knowledge will always be useful. And they actually bribed practically those medical school professors. So I asked them, don't look at over there. My son is sitting there. He's not a student, but he's listening. So all these professors were doing a favor to my parents by allowing me illegally sit through those medical school classes. Hmm. Okay, so then the revolution ended in 76, but you right. came to the States six years later in 82. What right. happened at 76? And then tell us how you ended up coming to the States. So in 1976, the Cultural Revolution ended after 10 years, from 66 to 76. Uh, China realized what a tragic mistake it has made by sh having shut down all universities and colleges of entire China for that 10 years and having practically destroyed the future of whole generation of young people. So they stopped cultural revolution, reopened all the colleges, and there was a chance to uh, apply for college, take the SAT equivalent, National College Entrance Exam. But I only had junior high education. I was, you know, basically dropped out of school three years prior. So the last three years, I've not been studying. I was playing music instrument, learning dancing, and also trying to study medicine illegally. And the, so my parents said, well, you need to go back to school. Um, I said, go back to ninth. He said, no. They said, no. I said, 10th. They said, no. I said, 11th. They said, no. I said, 12th. They said, yes. I said, you mean want me to jump, go back to school, but jump three years ahead overnight? They said, yes. And I said, what's, what's the chance of getting to college, even if I somehow magically become a 12th grader? They say about 1%. Huh. Because there's so many students all the last 10 years of backlog all coming back to the cities applying for college. Because while well, they'll finish uh, high school in the preceding 10 years, they were not allowed to go to apply for college because all colleges were shut down for 10 years throughout China. So I sa said to my parents, you, you, you want me to jump ahead three years overnight and somehow magically become 12th grader? Have you never studied 10th, 11th, 12th, and somehow participate in a college entrance exam, compete with against other 12th graders for their 1% chance? They said, correct. I said, you guys are crazy. <laughs> Mom said, we're not crazy. She said, how long did the government shut down colleges? I said, 10 years. Uh, she said, okay. Um, now they reopen all the colleges, that's wonderful, but what is to prevent them from shutting down again next year for mm -hmm. another 10 years? So you see people who didn't have freedom, when freedom came, even briefly, they appreciate so much. So I had to do the impossible, jumping three years ahead and compete against other 12th graders for the college entrance exam. But my mom and dad helped me. They borrowed some old exams 10 years prior. They hand copied onto little pieces of papers. We couldn't afford Xeroxing. And uh, so they drilled me every night with little pieces of papers containing those old exam questions. So it made me, made me study like 10, 15 hours a day. Wow. So yeah, it was really hard, but I, I, I had to do it because I did not want to return to the darkness of not having a future. Mm -hmm. And you came to get your MD. Were you already enrolled? Did you just show up and apply? Like, how did you get into Harvard? 
I uh, actually first went to University of Maryland um, for when I first came. Um, I could not go in, get into medical school right away. Um, I, I study a subject that um, uh, many American students I mean, I want to study, which is um, classical physics, quantum mechanics, laser physics. And uh, that's how I could get into school. And I had to support myself. I work at the same time when I was in graduate school. Um, so I got a PhD degree in laser physics uh, from Maryland and then finished postdoc uh, at MIT. And then uh, that was uh, 1987. I was 26 years old. Then I thought, well, now I have the technical background. Um, this is a free country. And since I always wanted to become a doctor ever since I was a kid, mm. now it's the time to do it. So I applied for medical school. Um, and um, actually, I was um, discriminated against uh, by a professor mm. at Johns Hopkins who think, you know, you're Chinese, you you know, we don't know how good you are. And, and it's hard getting to medical school, even for American born uh, kid. And you're from China. You don't have any chance. But that actually inspired me to work even harder. Yeah. And I, thought, well, I fought once after Cultural Revolution. That was for myself to have freedom. Now I could, I could fight again, uh, uh, you know, to get into medical school, but also not just for myself, but for anybody who, you know, has been discriminated against. Um, so I work even harder and uh, I got into both Johns Hopkins and Harvard and uh, partly because this professor, I went to Harvard. So 1987, I enrolled in the Harvard and MIT joint MD program to get my second doctor degree, uh, this time an MD in medicine. Was that professor who treated you that way because you're from China an exception in your experience or have there been a few people that have treated you differently and discriminated you because of your race, a common experience since you've come to the yeah. States? And I would say, uh, yes, yes, there are, there are actually other uh, few people, including one professor at the PhD program when I was studying. However, um, my overall experience of coming to America has been extremely positive and I'm very grateful because almost um, everybody else except these few folks that really welcome me with their own open arms. I mean, imagine I couldn't speak English. I did not know the culture, language. I have no social background and uh, I have no money. And uh, But it is America, the country that gave me the opportunity to work hard and to realize my dream. Um, so I think the people from around the world, like myself, uh, many immigrants and uh, refugees and the, you know, the people put their, line, their lives sometimes on the line so they can come here uh, is because um, the bedrock of this country, which is freedom, guaranteed by constitution, but also later on, I found Christ in my life and the other cornerstone of America is the Bible. Okay, so let's talk about that. You describe yourself as a scientific-minded atheist. When did you start to shift or when did those questions come? Uh, what were you in China? Were you in the States? Tell us kind of those first moments, if you will, and then let's probe into the story. Um, I um, actually, uh, you know, I was not, obviously not born as a Christian. I was born as an atheist and I came to America as an atheist, just like um, the Chinese student in the movie, the book and the movie, God's Not Dead, written by our mutual friends, Dr. Rice Brooks. And uh, just like that student, uh, that student life is inspired by my life story mm. in the book, God's Not Dead. So I came to this country, I was not interested in anything else except science, because I, for all my life, finally had the opportunity to study science. I was not going to be distracted by anything else. But then after the PhD program, PhD degree in laser physics, and then I got my, you know, the second doctorate degree program, an MD at, at Harvard. It was in a study of medicine. In fact, in a study of the human eye, hmm. that's the seed of um, a, uh, becoming, eventually become a believer uh, was started. I was studying the human eye and because I wanted to become a laser eye surgeon, since I had the laser background PhD, if I study MD and medicine and particular eye, I could be a very unique laser eye surgeon who knows medicine and also laser uh, technology, uh, which are very few in the world who have both degrees. 
among laser eye surgeons. So I was studying this human eye and uh, something became clear and clear to me that it's interesting that in our human brain, all of us in each of our head, half of the brain neurons, half were involved, are involved in vision. Hmm. So that the vision is disproportionately important for human survival than almost any other senses, you know, touching, speaking, hearing. So because so much neurons involved in the vision signal uh, capturing, uh, processing, interpretation, and it quickly became clear to me that with a scientific background, uh, you know, PhD in laser physics, and I realized that it is just impossible that the atheist worldview would hold. That means how could all these trillions and trillions of cells uh, that combine themselves form a functional eye in a short span of, you know, nine months, 10 months during the, you know, a child, uh, the, the, during the pregnancy for, for a child. So um, there's just so many things can go wrong that most of us should be born blind, but yet most of us are born with a sight, we can see. So I started um, uh, asking a professor this question. I said, how could all this complicated eye part, neurons and photoreceptors that form in such a short period of time, uh, which is such a near perfection and um, out the random? So I, I kept on passing his, uh, him with these questions that basically my worldview, atheist worldview was in crisis. I could not answer a basic important question like human eye structure. So finally he took me out for lunch and he said, I mean, what's a cross street? I said, that's a car. He said, what's the difference between a car and a human eye? I said, human eye is a lot more complicated. He said, okay, can you imagine how a random piece of metal on the street assemble itself into a car? I said, no way. Then he leaned over, he said, how about human eye? Hmm. And so right there, he basically just opened a window in my life making me realize that the reason the human eye being so complicated but yet can form nearly so perfect and nearly every time is because it is it, it, it is not formed out of randomness that atheist worldview will hold but it was formed with a specific purpose and that purpose is vision mm. so there's a designer there's a creator behind it all and of course going from that realizing there's a creator to eventually become a Christian who realized that the Creator has a name in Jesus Christ. Uh, Christ died for our sin at the cross, and you know that that, that that that's a long process, which was described in my autobiography book, which I have a copy um, called mm -hmm. uh, "From Darkness to Sight," and uh, uh, it's called "From Darkness to Sight" because um, it's not uh, not just those blind orphan children uh, that our foundation being able to help over the decades their remarkable journey from darkness to sight, but also how these kids, their courage, uh, have also inspired me to come from my own darkness to light spiritually. That's a fascinating title, especially because you're an eye surgeon from literal darkness to physically seen, but spiritual darkness to spiritual sight. You're obviously playing on that. Let me, yes. let me take a couple steps back on your story. You won't be able to go into the depth, obviously, in your book, and I hope folks will pick that up. But it was Darwin who famously said, the design in the eye made him shudder. Mm -hmm. And he and later thinkers like Dawkins kind of point towards these simpler eyes that exist in other organisms all the way up towards the most complex human eye. Mm -hmm. What convinces you that there couldn't be kind of a step-by-step -step incremental naturalistic explanation for the eye and that some kind of creator is required? Um, great question, great question. Um, the, the fact that Darwin himself, his theory of evolution, the Achilles tendon of his theory, the weakest point, is the human eye that he mm -hmm. readily admitted in his book that that human eye is so complicated that this evolutionary viewpoint it just doesn't hold in a context human eye, particularly how the eye could form. Uh, the fact that I discovered practically the same thing as Darwin did, you know, 200 years later in modern time when I was studying the human eye, 
shows that at the end of the day, as Dr. Weisbrook always have been advocating with his God's Not Dead lecture tours throughout the United States and the world, and many of those lecture tours that he fortunately uh, that I was involved and he invited yeah. me to talk about the scientific aspect. Um, we play tag team. I talk about more science, and he talk about more scripture, spiritual. That the his premises is be open minded and uh, go to where the truth leads you. And I think that's um, that's the ultimate. You know, the ultimate is we want the truth, right? And so uh, the fact that Tao Wen, who uh, was an atheist and who developed this wonderful, very impactful theory about human understanding of the world, the evolution, 200 years ago and 200 years later, I discovered the same conundrum, the same problem that human eye is the weakest point of this evolutionary theory. The complexity of human eye make evolutionary forming such a complicated structure impossible. It shows that there's some truth to it. Both he and I discovered the same thing, right? There's some the weak point, a fundamental weak point in evolutionary theory. Now, I, as we will make get into more uh, discussion, um, I am um, uh, I'm a common ground seeker, uh, Sean. I love common ground. I love bring people together. I love to listen on both sides, and I love to find the element of uh, truth that is um, somehow embedded in people's viewpoint. That is truth. That is the ultimate truth. Is what we are seeking. In this case. Uh, last night, I was with 400 kids on the Zoom, and the question asked me, Dr. Wen, do you believe in evolution and oh. uh, the, the creation? And my answer, I said, you'll be surprised. I actually believe in both. And mm -hmm. I believe that the creation, uh, be, because I believe they address different questions. The creation has to do with how the genesis of life, the genesis of the human parts, in this case, I, and evolution has to do with the change, adaptation of that uh, evolutionary, uh, creationally created um, structure, uh, how it uh, evolves and adapting to environment. And because there's undeniable evidence of change, undeniable evidence of adaptation of all species across the globe over time. So, so you, 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 it, it is true, and you cannot avoid seeing that, but yet, the fundamental problem of evolutionary theory is that it could not uh, explain this complexity of structure and the complexity mm. of your life, how it could come uh, with such a specific form with all the other possibilities. It's just, just so many possibilities is impossible that random theory, random adaptation will form a form, a structure such as human eye, um, complicated as such. So I believe creation is true because it addresses genesis of life and evolution is true because it addresses the change adaptation of life forms after it was created that's really helpful and raises a ton of questions that i have for you but we're going to in a minute come to why you went from believing there's a creator to the christian creator but first I have to ask you are trained obviously remarkably one of the top universities in china you got your MD from Harvard. You got your PhD in laser physics. So clearly you're trained in science and that you have a religious faith. So you obviously don't buy the idea that science and faith are in conflict. Talk about what you think is the relationship between the two of them. Great question, Sean. I appreciate the question. I Last night, again, I was in front of 400 some young generation students and um, talk about a purpose-driven life. And um, uh, the, 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 the question was asked, said, Dr. Wang, isn't it, you talk about Christian faith, but isn't it true that in universities, among intellectuals, uh, majority today are not believers? So how do you explain that? Mm. And my answer to, which is your question, I'm answer to the student, I said, well, it is true. In universities, the majority of the scientists today are not Christians. It's true. So one might conclude then, science and faith is mutually exclusive. 
you know, uh, that, that it cannot be combined and don't have the common ground. If you study science, by necessity, you will uh, hold a atheist worldview. But as I said, however, what I've learned over my lifetime, uh, which is depicted in my autobiography book, uh, From Document to Sight, which now turned into movie sight now, is that the more science I've learned over decades, you know, I went to school for 31 years to get both doctorate degrees, you know, PhD in laser physics. And, and, yeah. and, and so I studied for a long time. So in so far as the I, I would say I probably have achieved the, the most amount of knowledge and study the humankind could have. But interesting thing is, uh, as a more science study that I study, more advanced I am in the scientific and the I field, more, not less, evidence that I've discovered they're pointing to the existence of creator. Because the more mystery uh, that is came through and the less explainable by random collisions by atheists believe. So I told the, the student last night, I said, yes, there are many scientists that are not believers, but if you look at in the history of human scientific pursuit, some of the top scientists, there are many of them are, were believers. So the proportion of scientists who believe in creator actually increases if you go to the highest tier of scientific advancement and expertise. So that is, I encourage your students, you study more science, study harder, because you're gonna discover more advance in your, in, put into the, the, the greater, uh, you know, the top tier of scientists uh, rank, you mm -hmm. will actually find a more common ground not less between science and faith. So you have this conversation with a professor at lunch, and he opens your eyes up to saying, oh my goodness, there's really design in the eye. Of course, that's consistent with Islam, Judaism, Mormonism, some understandings of Hinduism. What were the steps that started to lead you to identify that creator as found within Christianity and Jesus being that creator in particular? Great question. Uh, in my autobiography, From Darkness to Sight, um, that, which is now uh, made into the movie Sight now, I, I talk about how I was um, impacted by many um, other physicians, that group of physici physicians who are dedicated Christians, um, the American Medical Dental Society members. Uh, in particular, there was a professor who I respect a lot, you know, professionally. And uh, then uh, actually I was, um, I was influenced by a young lady who, who was a dedicated Christian who was also uh, studying to be ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. And uh, she brought me to this group of um, physicians who, uh, who are uh, Christians. So first of all, I respect these physicians because they're professional achievements. But at the same time, I listened and attended meetings and and see how faith has guided in their life and uh, i realized that to be an ultimate physician is to recognize that um our science science is a tool, just a tool you need a bigger purpose for life and they told me about jesus christ told me the resurrection told me about um god yes there's a creator we, by then i believe there's a creator the creator has a name uh, because Jesus died for our sin as a human being because he loves us. And then three days later, he rose from dead, proving that he can conquer death. And uh, so I realized that as a human being that we have an opportunity for eternity um, if we follow Jesus Christ. And we have an opportunity to um, serve, in this case, all these physicians serving, not just with medical knowledge, but also with a heart uh, to help others. Um, it is, so it is the influence of these physician Christians and Christians, their dedication, they're using science as a mm -hmm. necessary tool, but made me realize that science is necessary, but it's not sufficient to have a purpose-driven life. The sufficient condition has to come from faith and in creator, but also more specifically in Jesus Christ. So resurrection proved God uh, has a name 
in Jesus Christ who died our sin. Resurrection proves that he is the ultimate inspiration for us to have not just mastered the science and skills, but also realize there's a higher purpose, what we're going to use, what we're going to use the tools for. And for different people have different um, purposes that God wants us. For me, is to use my long, hard-earned skills, 31 years of schooling, to help those who need the most help which are blind mm. often to children. So it's awesome to hear about the number of other scientists and doctors who were living out their faith and they shared this with you. Yes. Did you need to say, all right, I trust you guys, this story's great, but I'm gonna probe into the evidence myself. I mean, you're such a scientific-minded person. Were you reading the evidence for the resurrection? Were you studying the reliability of the Bible? Or did the story just ring so true to you that it, you knew it was true, and didn't need that evidence, at least initially? Um, I, I always want evidence as, as a scientist. Okay. Yeah, and um, that's sort of um, being ingrained in me because of my parents who were scientists. And uh, um, yes, I did look into the resurrection and uh, in terms of uh, did it happen? And uh, it was, to me, it was uh, uh, unquestionably true because mm. it was... Um, proven by different people at different times through different means. And from a scientific standpoint, if a fact that that had been pr proven by different people who are not related at different times and different ways, and that is um, uh, it's a very scientific uh, way of looking at if something's really true or not. And uh, also um, the fact that one can I think the difference between being having uh, believing creator and creator has a name in Jesus Christ is that there's a personal relationship I can mm -hmm. de develop with the creator who guide me um, that through my life doing different things uh, that especially if I got stuck or in difficulty. So my second evidence uh, that convinced me that God has a name in Jesus Christ is that and then I start my life as a Christian that believing him, but yet I still continue looking for evidence beyond the resurrection. And um, so one particular example is I started doing research, trying to figure out how could I help people with in, uh, chemical injuries that result in uh, blindness in their eyes due to scarring. And I found that the only person who does not scar are uh, unborn child. Uh, however, how can you do research on the fetus without hurting a baby, yet I do want to do research. I do want to do research to help these kids and uh, blind orphan children and other people who have got blinded due to injury and trauma and resulting eye scarring. So, well, I, I submit to God. I say, well, God, is there an answer to this question? You know, hmm. um, if you're there, if you're real, give me some idea. I got stuck now between the conflict between science and faith. You know, if up to the atheist scientists, they will do the stem cell research, fetal research, no problem. But if the, up to the Christians, we don't want to do stem cell fetal research um, because life is sacred, as the Bible said. But mm. I realize that second viewpoint uh, has a problem too, because without research, our life's quality cannot be improved. You know, creating new medical treatment, medical, uh, you know, and stem cell research, fetal research are important, are critically important because the top four, five causes of human mortality today are cancer, um, stroke, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, and diabetes. All of them can, if could eventually be conquered by stem cell research. So I believe these two camps are too polarized, the atheists and scientists. And there's a truth that both sides should learn from each other. You know, atheists should learn about Christian faith and Christian should learn about science. You know, uh, you, you, it, it does not make sense to me. A pastor, on, uh, uh, if one time there's a pastor, I went to a church visiting and a pastor on Sunday said, oh, I got headache, but I don't believe in medicine. I'm going to, everybody just pray for me. But next day, Monday morning, eight o'clock, he pick up phone and call the doctor. <laughs> you know, there's a lack of sincerity there. And the, I think we need to be truthful, authentic, mm -hmm. that I feel science is an indispensable part of our lives. Our lives are transformed by science, such as cell phone, you know, transform the way we live. Um, so I submit my uh, uh, the conundrum, the dilemma to God, and I said, show me, God, uh, I want to do research on fetal tissue, but at the same time, you know, to help patients 
restore their eyesight, but I don't want to hurt the baby. Um, and in the book talk about, I was interacting with um, a doctor who is a scientist and uh, uh, and also a Christian. And he just said, you know, Ming, God said, James 1 for perseverance, to keep it, mm. don't, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. So I, I was studying with some other scientists at the time, uh, one notably Dr. Chen and several others, and we just keep on probing this question, I keep on praying. And it's one of those uh, prayers that I think God somehow that, that gets instilled in my mind this idea that, well, instead of touching any part of the baby, since the unborn child can heal without scar, and after birth we heal with scar. So something dramatic happened at the time of birth, and one possibility is the fact we lose the amniotic membrane, the envelope surrounds us, each of us, before birth. So is it possible this amniotic membrane surround each of us before birth is what actually convey uh, the, to give the child, unborn child, the ability to heal without scar. So you see, that's a God-inspired idea, and that's a result of the praying um, that um, not only um, that God does exist, but also God does care to develop a personal relationship with each of us because in that case it's my personal praying to him and personal asking for guidance. So I actually started doing research on the placenta. I got lots of placentas donated to me by mothers after giving birth to children. The placentas are discarded anyway. So uh, nobody has any problem using those amniotic membrane, but it's, it was connected to the baby. That's the magic part of it before birth. You know, it's like a blanket around the baby. So I got these um, placenta brought to the laboratory and tease out a little thin saran wrap membrane out of the placenta that used to surround all of us before birth. And I was doing research on this amniotic membrane to see if it does reduce scar and regenerate the eye. And it does. Um, so I eventually developed amniotic membrane contact lens. And it's interesting that the, when amniotic membrane contact lens was put on these injured eyes, indeed, it essentially we create this uh, before birth environment on top of eye allow the eye to regenerate once again and reduce the scar um, uh, improving eyesight then i decided you know i'm just gonna uh, give the technology to the world so i um, put online the my patent um, and um, i actually uh, went around the world to about nearly 60 nations uh, teach about the amniotic membrane contact lenses over 20 year period or so I taught over 10,000 eye doctors. So today, amniotic membrane contact lens is a worldwide $100 billion industry now. And then uh, doctors from nearly every nation uh, have used the amniotic membrane contact lenses and millions of patients have had their eyesight um, improved and restored. Um, to me, it shows that amniotic membrane contact lenses powerful technology can utilize fetal tissue, stem cell, but yet preserving life at the same time, science and faith do work together. That's such a remarkable story of God's common grace, that God has given us the commission to use science to help people. He's given us the minds to do so. He's given an environment in which we can apply it. And so in your journey to faith, praying to God for some kind of technology to help people, and the Christian God specifically answered it by giving you this idea is one of the things that solidified you in your faith. So it's a combination of being convinced there's a creator, uh, looking at the Gospels and the person of Jesus and also examining the evidence and then having an answered prayer. So how did this affect you? Because as I hear you talk about your story, it was difficult growing up, but it seems like you felt cared for, you had purpose, you come to America, you had a family that provided for you and loved you. You come to America, you're grateful for freedom. So becoming a Christian how did that affect or shape you personally, professionally, relationally? Great question. I think there are three major differences that uh, being a Christian has made in my life. Number one is a purpose. Hmm. That um, I, after I became a doc, finished my 31 years of schooling, and I was ready to practice medicine as an eye doctor, I pray again uh, as a Christian, you know, why should I do? What is God you want me to do that specific, beyond my, my regular job as an eye doctor, what is you want me to do specific for you? And uh, 
in those prayers that I felt that God was giving me a direction that I used, I should use my long sought after learned, you know, learn long, uh, difficult learned process to learn medical skills, 31 years schooling to help those who need the most help, which are blind, orphaned children. So, um, that's uh, my book uh, from uh, from darkness to sight once again i showed early that has to, to do with the stories of these kids blind orphan children from around the world how they have restored their uh, how we have restored their eyesight the miracles i would say that the glory of these stories miracles belong to christ because mm-hmm. god was the one that instilled in my mind uh to begin with that i should use my long hard-earned medical skill to help those who need the most help, those blind orphan children. So first difference is purpose. That a God-centric purpose, a God-inspired purpose that is beyond what we normally do. And I always tell my fellow Christians is that whatever job you have, you could be a real estate person, you could be um, you know, a business person, you could be a computer scientist, but what does God want you to do beyond you what you normally do that's specific for Him? For me, Beyond what not, not what I normally do, laser eye surgery is these charity surgeries to help these kids. Mm. Second, so that's a major different purpose. Second is eternity. That being a Christian, that gave me this fundamental uh, uh, comfort that and a chance that if I be a good Christian, since God has died for our sin at the cross and rose from death three days later, proving that He can conquer death. So being a Christian. I may have a chance for eternity as well with him. And the third difference beyond the purpose, beyond a chance of eternity, is the journey. And that being a Christian doesn't mean that I just declare to the world I'm Christian today, I'm just perfect and that that my life is... No, it's a journey and the life is no less challenging. Mm -hmm. And this journey is a commitment that means um, God is the leader in my life that when I have problems, when I'm stuck in something, I need to recognize I could ask him for guidance, for help through prayer. And I just told you the example that uh, when I stuck with the science and faith, you know, I want to help patients reduce eye scarring, restore eyesight, knowing um, the fetus can heal without scar, doing research on fetal tissue, but at the same time, I don't want to hurt the baby. I don't want to hurt the life. So I fortunately prayed and listened carefully what God wanted me to do eventually that the idea came to use the placenta is a God-inspired idea. Mm. So the three major differences being a Christian, a God-centered purpose, using science, but to, for, to do what? To do what God wants me to do, to help blind orphan children. Second, a chance for eternity, because he is the one who has conquered death, so we could have a chance as well, being a Christian. And third, is a journey. There's a lifelong commitment, the commitment that we need to ask always, resort to him, ask for help when we're in trouble in life. Those are three great answers. Now, I've noticed just watching some of your videos online and, of course, your book that you wrote, that you are outspoken about your faith. You described earlier times where you were discriminated against because you're from China. Mm-hmm. Have you at, at times been discriminated against in the academic world, in the medical world because of your faith? Has it helped you? Is it a non-issue? Uh, talk about that a little bit, if you will. Uh, great question, Sean. I appreciate this question very much. Yes, I was discriminated against in the academic world uh, I, because of my outspokenness about my faith. Um, in fact, in one um, occasion that uh, people challenged me on the podium, I was speaking about the amniotic membrane contact lens because I've been teaching for 20 years. The doctors and, you know, as I told you, I basically donate the technology to the world and uh, trying to help doctors learn so that we can increase the speed of dissemination of knowledge. And so I could share that discovery that uh, as I was describing scientific presentation, no problem, but I want to describe the uh, genesis of it, the idea, as mm-hmm. I described to you, um, some people challenged and, um, you know, uh, they were not, they, they didn't believe that they have anything to do with mm-hmm. Christian faith. Okay. So, in fact, this is how I answered. So I was challenged um, sometimes because of my outspokenness about faith in the scientific arena. Uh, this is what I told them, um, the, a story. I told them a story um, that 
people believe there's no common ground between faith and science. So, uh, and I used to think that true. If I become a Christian, then, you know, it's difficult for science and faith to work together. But through MDR membrane contact lens development, which is featured in the film site upcoming, that talk about it can actually work together. They can create science fetal stem cell uh, the technology without hurting the baby, right? And uh, so I um, told those people, atheist scientists who challenged me, I said, well, uh, you don't believe there's a common ground? between science and faith? They said, no, we don't believe that. We said, okay, let me tell you this story. When I started practicing medicine, I have a strong desire. I want to pray with my patients hmm. because faith had played a significant role in my training of becoming an eye doctor, as I told you. The, dis the discovery of complexity of eye and the guidance of these Christian and the scientists, the doctors in my life. And so um, I want to pray, but then people told me that just like those scientists who challenge me in scientific uh, presentations when I talk about faith, that no, atheists will un be unhappy, uh, Dr. Wang, if you pray, okay? They will not come back to you to see you as an eye doctor. Then I realized, well, that's true, you know? So then again, praying, it, that's key. I pray again, I say, well, God, I want to pray with my patient before eye surgery because I, uh, faith is such an important part of my event, if I, if I eventually become an eye doctor. But at the same time, I don't want to lose these patients. And uh, so, so um, I consulted my church elders and consulted the physicians and the Christians who I look up to. And they told me that if the right thing to do, there's a price to pay. And, you know, uh, Christ paid the ultimate price by dying for our sin at the cross. So, I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to pray. I'm going to God limp and pray with all my patients. So ever since I started my career, I pray with all my patients before each of my eye surgeries for them. But as a scientist, I always want to do research. And because people say there's no common ground between science and faith. If up to the atheist, they don't want me to pray. If I, uh, up, I'm my, up to myself, I want to pray with my patient before surgery, doing their surgeries. So I collected over a two year period, about 200 some uh, non-Christian patients for different ways. I figure out they're not Christians and asked each of them the day after surgery. Over two year period, about 200 of them. And the question to them day after surgery is, now you're happy with your surgery yesterday, but what I want to know is, were you offended mm. when I prayed? And because I'm doing research, I'm always doing research, looking for evidence. Is there evidence supporting the science and faith or Christians and non-Christian could have common ground? It seems there's no common ground, right? Up to uh, non-Christians, they do not want me to pray. If up to the Christians, myself, I want to pray. Um, that's the questions raised by these atheist scientists in the scientific arena. When I present science and the faith, they were not happy about the faith aspect. They challenge me because they don't believe that they are scientists. They could not have anything to do with faith. So the answer came back with these over 200 so <clears throat> people that I surveyed the day after surgery over two year period. Almost all of them said this way. I said, Dr. Wang, yesterday before my eye surgery, uh, you did pray for me. Um, I was not only not offended, um, I was moved. Mm. I said, well, would you be moved that when I pray to my Christ that you do not believe? And they told me, the reason I was moved is because yesterday underneath your laser, that I was lying there, I was nervous, my eye surgery was coming, and you did come to my ear and um, say, you know, Johnny, is it okay um, if I pray for us before your eye surgery? And um, honestly, well, the, the reason I asked for that, uh, Sharon, is because I was told I'm supposed to be politically correct. I should ask for permission. So I did every single prayer before I always ask permission. And then the, <laughs> these folks told me the day after in the service, they said, Dr. Wen, honestly, I was so nervous underneath your laser. When my surgeon come to my ear and said, can I pray with you? I did not dare to say no. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> I, I, I took advantage of the situation, but I took advantage for God, so I felt okay. But my question is, were you offended? And they say, no, not only I was not offended when you pray, but I was moved. And I said, how could you moved when you do not believe the Christ that I pray? Yeah. Yeah. And they say, the reason I was moved is because in one of my most important moments, in my life, which is my eye surgery. Yeah. I do not want anything to go wrong. 
Okay, it has to do with the vision for the rest of my life. You brought something that is most important to you, mm. your Christ. And I appreciate that. So at that moment, I realized that it's the love for fellow human being that transcends the boundary and the uh, faith and religion. It's the love for fellow human being that is our ultimate common ground. That's a great answer. I have one last question for you, and then I want you to tell us specifically about the film that's coming out. So you're a scientist and a doctor. You see a lot of pain and suffering and brokenness in the world. How do you make sense of that? Like, why do you think God allows so much pain and suffering when he could just stop it and doesn't need surgery from somebody like yourself, so to speak? I think God is looking for human growth in each of us in a real sense, meaning um, just like people in America today have taken some, how many of us have taken the freedom for granted because we always had freedom. And the manifestation of that taking for grantedness of our freedom is our unprecedented polarization, the unwillingness to work together across racial barriers, ethnic divisions, and political aisles. So if we had everything, God said everything just perfectly, we will not have the growth in our character. Just like one will not have the growth about appreciating freedom if you're born in a free society, never been challenged, never experienced uh, the lives without freedom. So I think God is looking for the ultimate growth in each of us, the character. Mm -hmm. And the character can only grow by our having experience of not having what we want, but also, even more importantly, by having the experience of making a decision to choose. Mm -hmm. Because if we born the perfect world, we don't need to choose. And we have no experience of otherwise without them. So it is the inner growth that God is uh, that they're looking for. So he allows these things to happen. These bad things happen because he's looking for us to have the experience of the bad things so that in comparison, we know what's good things. But not only that, he gives us the choice to make a decision, each of us. By making a decision, we can grow as a person. So that's a manifestation of ultimate love God for us. Mm -hmm. He does not want to just pamper us with, you know, the silver spoon in our mouth. He wants us to grow by experiencing, grow by making our own decisions. That's a really helpful perspective. Obviously, a ton more can be said about evil, suffering, and pain, but given what you've been through and that you're an eye doctor in particular, a surgeon, that's a really, really helpful angle to approach this. I, I appreciate you sharing that. Last question. Tell us about your film coming out. I can't wait for my kids to see it. I want my audience to go see it and support your efforts. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. So the film site, we've been uh, trying to make it for 10 years. Wow. It is based on my autobiography from Darkness to Sight. As I said, um, it has to do with two parallel lines from Darkness to Sight. Those kids, their blind orphan children, how our foundation have helped them come from Darkness to Sight physically, but also at the same time, how these kids, their courage, determination has also helped me, their eye doctor, to come from my own darkness to light uh, spiritually. So this uh, book is being turned into a, a movie site, and uh, it will be released um, by Andrew Studios, which distributed Chosen, The Bible Story, The Sound of Freedom last year. On May 24th, uh, Friday, Memorial Day weekend, mm. actually happened Asian Heritage Month, and um, in theaters across North America. Actually, for the movie uh, site, uh, Dr. Rice Books and I also uh, published this book. It's called Side the Bible Study, because the movie called Sight. So people always say, what is the message? The message is seeing beyond. Mm -hmm. You know, we have challenges in life in, as human beings. We need to see beyond. So the movie, the storylines, and the side movie Bible study talk about five seeing beyond. Seeing beyond our pain, inspired by the people in the story, in the movie, that all of us, you know, are broken in some senses at some point in our lives. How do we see beyond the pain? Seeing beyond our circumstance, you know, as I mentioned today, that my parents saw beyond the circumstance during Cultural Revolution, believe that there's a better tomorrow for their kids. That's why uh, they work so hard instilling me 
imprinted in me the desire to work hard when I was very young. Seeing beyond uh, ourselves, and as I mentioned, one of the key differences that made for me as a Christian is the chance to realize that there's more to this life than what we see, the chance for eternity as, eternity as a Christian. Seeing beyond our own culture, uh, we talk about today about uh, the racial discrimination and very different things that shows that God wants us ultimately to respect all culture, all faith, um, all people, you know, uh, that finally seem beyond our pol polarization, you know, um, and the Bible said to all people, I'm all people, right? So that we are living in a world that it is so unprecedentedly polarized that we uh, are so fixated on differences rather than appreciating what we what we have in common. We're so unable to work together across political aisles, racial divides, and ethnic divisions. And why we're so polarized is because we have taken the freedom for granted. Mm. And then you say, is it true? If you're taking something for granted, result in dispute and polarization? Correct. It's like marriage. Husband, wife, you have this, uh, the, when you have differences, if you don't appreciate marriage, you're more likely to yelling and shouting at each other hurting each other's feelings. But if you do appreciate marriage, you're more likely to um, say, honey, we're different on this thing, yes, but don't we have have so much else in common? Mm. So lack of desire to seek common ground in human being is a manifestation of underlying problem. The diagnosis is underlying problem is that we have taken what we have for granted. Now, human nature drives us to polarization because money control power. So the only way to come get us out of the deadly spiral of polarization is to heed a higher calling. In the film, there is a storyline, as you see, that is you know, suggesting an idea, higher calling. In this case, Jesus Christ, that he is the ultimate common ground seeker. And uh, Dr. Rice Books and I also have another book called The Common Ground Bible Study, which details what we have learned from scripture. Not only uh, Christ is the ultimate common ground seeker, but also he has taught us how to find the common ground. So overall, this film message is about freedom, it's about faith, it's about the need to seek common ground. So it's a film for all, uh, it's for Chinese Americans, immigrants, it's for Asian Americans, it's for Americans, it's for minorities, but most important is for all Americans. Basically it's this, sight is someone who used to have no freedom and come to uh, to, to, to want to remind America how blessed we are to live in the freedom. Just like someone who used to be blind, remind mm. us how precious sight is. So it may just take a story of immigrant to who used to not have freedom to remind all of us as Americans today, we're so blessed living in the country. We have freedom and we need to appreciate, not by just saying it, but actually doing it, meaning me being more willing to walk across our differences politically, racially, ethnically, to to build up America, to realize that this country is founded with two on two bedrock, which is the Constitution, give you the freedom, and the Bible, give you the faith. Dr. Wayne, you really have a remarkable story for our day of hard work about the American dream, about living a life to benefit and help other people, about the intersection of science and faith. Uh, really blows me. I was telling my wife last night, I said, you know, I think I've written half, maybe half a dozen journal articles. I'm a professor. You've written 100. One academic book, you've written 10. Uh, you also have an MD, and yet you're writing Bible studies and you're creating movies to get a message of hope and sight out to people. That's incredible. It's so encouraging. It's convicting. I can't wait for my family to see your movie, and I hope everybody here who's watching this with us still, we'll go check out Sight coming out May 24th, I believe it is, just to see, is it the kind of movie you can bring a non-Christian to and they'll be okay with it? Or is it going to be, tell, tell me the answer to that question. Can you bring a non-Christian to it? Is it designed yeah, for that? Absolutely. It's designed to bring two groups of people okay. and for us Christians. We want to bring our kids and some okay. kids are studying science and technology and some of them are leaving Christ. So this mm. is a 
and shows that science and faith can work together. You need the science to give you the tools, but you need Christian faith to give you a purpose, what you're going to use the tools for. And it's a film designed to bring atheist skeptics because okay. it is toned down. It did not talk about uh, uh, the Bible that you know did not say Bible, did not say Christ, and there's no altar cause. It is through the storytelling, through the transformation, the conversion story of the protagonist naturally as it is. So uh, we've been showing this film around the country. Nearly half the audience who come to the films were not from those churches. So what an amazing outreach events, right? So we encourage all Christians to bring kids and bring uh, friends, particularly atheist skeptics, because it's their experience that we together allow them to feel, allow them to make their own decisions after being exposed to wonderful stories that a scientist who is also guided by faith how could they de develop a purpose for their scientific work? And the, the place that they can get information for the film is angel.com slash site. Mm -hmm. Angel.com forward slash site. Check it out. We'll link to that below. Thanks for coming on. I've pushed way more time from you than, I, than you had given me. So I appreciate you staying on. Tell us about the film. Uh -huh. Before you go away, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other fascinating interviews and people lined up to tell their stories that intersect with apologetics and culture and worldview. And if you thought about studying apologetics, I would love to be your professor at Biola. We have the top-rate apologetics program in the country and beyond. Information is below. Check it out. Dr. Wang, thank you so much for all you're doing. This has really been a treat to have you on. Thank you, Sean. God bless you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you.